Thank you very much, Edie. And uh, we're having a little uh, fun with the microphone today because Alex is on the phone from Ireland. So I, I have to uh, lean over here very quickly. The STEM Results Project is a fascinating effort to map, to inventory, and to find out so much more about the metrics behind STEM programs across that span of organizations that we've discussed on the STEM Connector. In fact, that sprang out of the STEM Connector. Many of you said, well, that's great. Now we see what people, wh where they are, what they are doing, but what's being produced by the programs? We would love to know how so-and-so is successful or not. We're looking for role models. We're looking for best practices. We're looking for kindred organizations that might be three blocks away from us. We just don't know how to connect ourselves. And so the results project came out of a lot of help from your input, and we said, why not start inventorying and cataloging the results, meaning the metrics. Thanks to Cisco and its uh, benevolence, they forced us to use something they call smart metrics. That's specific, measurable, A for achievable, R for realistic, and T for time-bound metrics. And in the first phase of the project, we found some fascinating results. For example, uh, we're actually surprised about the number of very fine metrics we're getting from organizations that maybe didn't think of themselves as STEM organizations. Many of the professional societies have whole career paths, tracking, curriculum development, higher education. It's not just K through 12. We realize that this continuum is so important. So we're so excited because we think that we will be ultimately able to map out and inventory the entire STEM pipeline from STEM to Stern, as we joke, from STEM to Stern, through career, through early career life, uh, through the K through 12. All of these areas need to be better understood. And that's why this is so exciting to be in on the ground floor of a project involved in this scope. So uh, today we're going to have many sorts of uh, presentations. I'm going to flip it back to Edie. I'm just, oh, I'm sorry. One, one thing, I'm sorry, and I'll give yes, it to yes. Edie. I just want to, everybody here, if you are following our Twitter chat, the hashtag is hashtag STEM results. Uh, and we will be gathering questions if you have them. You can also email to um, ted.wells at stemconnector.org. We'll gather questions and we'll be addressing them in the upcoming weeks on our blog, but it's hashtag STEM results if you are tweeting along. Uh, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Ted, thanks, and Bob, thanks. And, you know, we've been out to about 125 organizations. We've gotten back some 70 metrics, about eight pages each per organization. We've selected 14 presentations today. And if you go through the material, Everyone has seen the incredible lineup today, and those are up on the site, as we have said, but their full presentations are very metrics-driven against their programs and goals. What we'd like to do now is to start off, and I'll tell you, you hear me talk about love and hugs. But I've grown to love and respect Alex Fellows. Alex Fellows, as you see, is the education portfolio manager at Cisco, starting out for those many years as a teacher himself. But Alex helped Teach for America get off the ground. He's helped Reasoning Mind organization by organization. He was so instrumental with his team to get the network academies going around the world, 150 countries now. He put 4 million kids through the network academy. So, Alex Fellows, you can read that background, but you can also tell that he's pushing the envelope not only to the privilege, but as so many of you in the room are doing, is recognizing that is a newer community, a diverse community, and in a community that needs help U.S. and worldwide, that has to make it in STEM. So it is our pleasure as STEM Connector, and thanks to Cisco, you're going to be hearing 
so much about STEM results, STEM results, and we thank you, Alex Bellows. Alex? Well, that's a very warm introduction, Edie. Thank you. I hope that I can be heard uh, adequately so I don't drive everybody a bit crazy. Um, I'm delighted to, to, to be participating in the STEM Results Town Hall. And even though I am here in lovely Dublin, and it really is a lovely place, never been here before, um, but the sun was shining, the wind was blowing, it was 60 today for a high. Um, I understand this is kind of unusual, so I guess it's just something special for us. Um, Alex, we know back. you're in Dublin, but speak up a little bit. <laughs> okay, I'll crank it up a little bit. Um, Cisco has uh, had a position as a leader in STEM education for the last um, 16 years. Uh, our networking academy program has uh, facilitated three and a half million students to achieve in math, science, and all the disciplines required to succeed in that particular program. We're very, very um, happy with the idea that we can offer some guidance and leadership when the in the area of STEM, and it's our intent to focus on metrics initially so that we can get a strong sense of where people are, what they're doing, and how they're how successful they feel they're being at that particular process. This is a vision of how STEM, the STEM Results Project fits in with our other missions, is that STEM Connector, Astra STEM Results Project, and the other um, related projects will create a portfolio of knowledge and a space that will continue to be relevant throughout the next uh, three to five years. Um, we are using as many of the technologies as we can muster that are appropriate to facilitate and to, and to outfit a STEM Astra to do this work in partnership with us. We hope that over the next year or so that we'll be able to expand and directly link the STEM connection um, projects and process models with workforce preparedness in a seamless uh, capacity and a seamless process that will help underserved populations that have high dropout rates understand why and how what they do in school relates directly to their lives. For a lot of kids, that's an unfinished equation. So we're using the STEM results. We're providing them on a pilot basis to the instructors that deal with about 200,000 students that are not succeeding. And we're, we're, we're focusing a lot of our attention and energy on those populations. We believe that, that as we press on with the quality of the people that are, that are involved with STEM Astra, that we can bring to the general population of instructors and decision makers the opportunity to have a commonly assessed, commonly reported, commonly shared uh, metric for instruction in STEM. Now, how we get there, this is another question. Um, I've been fortunate at Cisco to be encouraged to make mistakes, not, not real big ones, you know, not real expensive ones, but from anyway, and I plan on doing that as rapidly and as uh, vigorously as I can because mistakes may were pushing the envelope. I think that Edie and her team are capable of being the leaders and the organizers and the facilitators for these discussions better than anyone else I've found. That's my hope that our partnership will grow and expand and develop 
lots of clear, concise, specific, and actionable items. So thank you, Edie. Thank you, Bob and Ted, for you know allowing me to say a few words. And I'll let you go. Alex, we'll be really proud to tell you that over 600 people are listening across the country. No, well, that's terrific. Um, I'm, I'm sad that I couldn't be there, but um, my wife and I have my birthday. On the so we're going to start the first of our presentations today. Uh, the speakers will have to come up here to the podium uh, because we are broadcasting all over the world. So uh, our first speaker Perfect. today... Really, uh, many of you know him so well. There are few youth-serving institutions as iconic as the National 4-H Council. Uh, it has over 100 years of service in the 4-H. Great institutions grow with the times, and under the leadership of CEO Don Floyd, the National 4-H Council implemented its National Science Initiative as part of its Positive Youth Development Program with the goal of reaching 1 million students and youth by 2013. They have far exceeded that goal and today reach over 5 million youth. It's clear, therefore, why we have asked Don to speak about his results profile, and it's my pleasure now to introduce Don Floyd today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edie. Uh, congratulations on redefining the science of drinking from a fire hose. I think we all have a lot of data coming at us today, so I'm going to try like to highlight a few things and pull maybe some of the best learning and practices we've had out of this kind of 10 years of trying to understand longitudinally what positive youth development effect has on science and science learning. And I want to make sure you know that Heather Elliott, my colleague, is sitting right there uh, for any other questions you may have. Uh, 4-H is this very large uh, youth organization been around for over 100 years in many communities, many of our partners in the room. I recognize many friends for a long time science-based organization brought to you by America's unique land-grant university system through the Extension Service, and that youth program is called 4-H. We would uh, love to be able to tell you that um, we have a longitudinal study, really, a longitudinal study, not just a pre-post test, no, a longitudinal study. We began um, in 1998 uh, to think about what we know from positive youth development and research around what had been hypothesis at the time. So we uh, engaged a major university to study what became 7,000 young people, 3,000 parents, hundreds and hundreds of schools across an incredibly diverse and wide demographic perspective. And even though this sample shows an oversample of the rural areas, trust me, every way you can slice um, our young people and their families and their communities is in this sur survey. It uses the modern technology of Jim Heckman, Nobel Laureate's propensity matching scoring, which is data intense and only possible because of really, really big computers. So we have excellent science behind this. The uh, work that Lerner has done is not hidden under a bushel. It's publicly published in all the scientific journals. It provides a really good scientific base, which leads me to finding number one. There is science around this. There's hard research. It no longer is, wow, my CEO wants to do this, or the governor wants to do this wonderful program that somebody talked to them about at dinner the night before. There's hard science about what works and what does not work. And it's published in America's leading scientific journals and developmental journals. I wanted to share with you a little bit about what that science says, that there actually is this thing called high-quality positive youth development, that when you take a young person as an asset and their individual strength, not a problem to be fixed, that you can combine that with the things that they do in community and produce young people that have competence and confidence and connection and character and contribution back to the community. But it requires three things. Number one, a long-term relationship with a caring adult. Number two, skill building that is realistic, and number three, leadership practice. Those three in combination are a special sauce, and dosage matters. The brush them and touch them stuff does not work. Scientific study shows that is true. 
So that's finding number two, make sure that all of us, including the donor community, those governments and corporations are following good science, not the whim of the week. We have science that shows this. 4-H young people are doing really, really well across this. Uh, you heard that we have a goal to reach 1 million new young people in our massive base across every community in America. We set a five-year goal. We actually hit it in four years. So we're able to bring 1 million new young people into this high-quality, positive youth development experience. Uh, we think that is thrilling and exciting. Uh, we also measure this a bunch of ways internally, so not just this one 10-year longitudinal study. And great news, girls are really doing terrific. And matter of fact, girls in 4-H programs, because of this unusually high dosage of high-quality, positive youth development, that long-term relationship with a caring adult over time, skill building and leadership, is producing results for girls that are better than any other youth organization, particularly when you put the content piece of science in the mix. We are thrilled with that. The other point and the final point I would make is that uh, we do this across a broad base of application and think this is point number three where we kind of miss it sometimes. We think as adults that we know is great for kids. Let's talk to young people about practical application, about why science matters, not just because we have to learn an equation or do what's required in school or do something we think is fun, but because it's got practical solution. So young people really want to know that the science they're learning relates to their everyday life. Across the 4-H network, there are 81,000 81, high standard approved curriculum adaptation that apply to local community solutions that young people are interested in across a wide range of science topics. And you can see the science topics, science topics up here. But at the end of the day, what we think this study, this 10-year research across a broad base shows that there is a science of high quality, positive youth development that when we make the right investments in it, produces life-changing experiences for young people so that they can get about solving the biggest issues that this world faces. I actually love the one on the right. The one on the right there talks about, really? You want kids to be into plant science? You betcha, because we have another two and a half billion young people to feed on this planet. Nobody can solve that today. And if we don't get young people fired up about ag science, for one, we're not going to be able to feed this plant. So, Randy, thank you and your team for supporting us. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, just want to remind, I know a lot of folks are joining us now online. Uh, hashtag for the Twitter chat is uh, hashtag STEM results. We were over 225 people when I looked last, so very exciting. Uh, Washington State has been the home to consumer and business innovations that have literally changed how we live. From Boeing to Microsoft to Starbucks, Washington has been an incubator of talent for the United States for generations. When industry realized, however, that the education system was not meeting the demand for talent in STEM fields, they took action and developed the innovative model of Washington STEM. Barely in its second year, but squarely focused on results, Washington STEM is a leader. Caroline King is the Chief Operating Officer of Washington STEM and brings a background in education policy. She has been both in the United States and abroad. She has been with Washington STEM, STEM since the very beginning and it is my pleasure to introduce her to you today. Thanks everyone and thank you Edie for the opportunity to share our perspective from Washington State. Washington STEM is a nonprofit organization located in Washington State. We launched just over a year ago by prominent business, education, and community leaders who realized that in our state, as was mentioned, we're a hub of innovation and economic growth. We have ranked number one in the concentration of STEM jobs in the country. So our founders realized that it's imperative that every young, every young person in our state be prepared and inspired in STEM so that they can lead a life of opportunity and success and that will remain that hub of innovation and continued economic growth. 
So that's what we're about. Um, on the question of how do we go about this, this, this quest, we've been about scale, every student in Washington. How do we do that? Well, we're just over a year old, I'll remind you, so we're more excited to learn from those of you who have been at this longer than us. Um, but I will say a little over a year in, three ingredients that we think are important to really set up the foundation for scale are listed here. We need a shared North Star, and by that I mean in our state, we realized we needed a common goal. We have a lot of people working on STEM education. We didn't have common goals, and then we didn't have common outcomes and indicators and tools to measure our progress towards those North Stars. That's the first thing. We needed real results. We need to see real outcomes on the ground for kids and then have the patience and the third ingredient, the willingness to take bold risks to find out how to move from pockets of excellence to systems of high, that support high performance at scale. And that's something we haven't been terribly good at in public education, and we're hoping to work with all of you to take that on. So I'll talk about these points um, in brief. In terms of shared North Star, again, this is about getting us all on the same page within our state on shared outcomes. We worked with our partners around the state consulted with many of you around the country, um, and came up with these three goals. We're about successful students, thriving communities, and a vibrant Washington. And in our state, that all revolves around STEM. As we look towards common outcomes and indicators, you can see those in our results profile, and we've developed outcomes and indicators to help measure progress at the student, teacher, and community level. Again, as we looked around, um, people were asking us for tools. How do we know great STEM education when we see it? We had the fortune to um, meet with some folks from Dayton, Ohio, Professor Jim Rowley, who had developed something called the STEM Education Quality Framework. They developed this to support their work with STEM fellows, who are a cadre of 100 folks per year, a mix of pre-K through 12 teachers, higher ed faculty, and STEM industry professionals who work in teams to develop high-quality STEM curriculum. They needed a tool to assess the quality of that curriculum once it was branched out into the classroom. Honestly, on their website is the only place I've found an aerospace curriculum for four-year-olds. You can check it out. Um, but here I'm going to show you a screenshot of the STEM Education Quality Framework. There's 10 components um, where you can assess the quality of what you're seeing. The components range from things like the depth of, of connection to STEM careers um, and the ability to engage diverse learners. Um, what we were able to do at Washington STEM was working with our colleagues in Dayton was to put, create an interactive online tool so that this tool could move from just being used by the, those 100 STEM fellows per year. Anybody in the country and the world can use this. We encourage you to do so. It's free. The link is listed here on the slide. Help us improve the tool. Help us all in this room and this community gain a common understanding of high quality STEM education and what it's going to take to improve it. Getting down to real results, um, I want to take you briefly to a school just outside of Seattle in Renton, Washington. Lake Ridge Elementary was one of our schools, course, performing schools for a real long time. Found itself in the bottom 5% of performing schools and won a competitive federal school improvement grant. With that money and funding, it focused on intensive teacher training working closely with faculty from the University of Washington and focusing primarily on math and ramping up the teacher's ability to support the new Common Core standards. What is it going to take to have these teachers be able to foster critical thinking and problem solving every day in the classroom focused on math? Um, what we see on this data, and I know these numbers are small, but just think red is bad, gr green is good. <laughs> um, in just one year of this intensive work, side by side in professional development, we've seen nearly a 20% decrease of students in red, students performing at the very bottom level, and what's exciting, nearly a 20% increase of students in the green performing at the highest level. So this school and this focus on teaching, not just about getting kids at standard, that blue line running across the horizontal axis, this is about getting kids to achieve at the world-class levels that we need them to. I was hoping to show you a short video because it's really amazing. You can go online to the teaching channel. Here's the link. Type in Lake Ridge Elementary and you will see what these kindergarten teachers, K through 5 teachers, are doing with their kids in the classroom. It's phenomenal. 
Um, and you will see these videos are annotated by showing what the Common Core State Standard is, is being taught, what the teacher is using to set up her lesson plans. We need videos and tools like this so that we show great examples of STEM teaching and learning, but then we need to sit down with teachers and other uh, business leaders and folks who are working in STEM education and help us understand how do we get from where we are today to the excellent teaching and learning that's produced these results at Lake Ridge. Finally, on the topic of bold risks, once we find some place like Lake Ridge, we need to have the patience and understanding to understand um, and the hard work to understand what it's going to take to get that up and running at a significant scale. We know that the model of professional development that they're doing there has real promise, but not every school in our state can have University of Washington faculty w working with them day in and day out. So how can we use technology to create a scalable model of professional development where coaching can be delivered real time to teachers anywhere in the world? We also know for systemic change, we need to think about policy change, and we need to think about um, what's been mentioned here before is rabid public demand for improvements in STEM education. So we look forward to working with all of you on this and learning more with and from you. Thank you so much. What Ted Wells wants to do with me is to announce that all of these materials are going to be up on STEM Connector starting tomorrow, and these rigorous approximately eight pages on each of these programs are going up on the website as well, so as you follow us. We do have a treat in the Lieutenant Governor of Iowa, but it's really important as you learn about Kim Reynolds and the extraordinary work she's doing with the Governor's Advisory Council for STEM to know that someone at her side is Dr. Jeff Wells, who is the Executive Director of the Governor's STEM Advisory Council. Let's go to the great Midwest and that great state of Iowa. Jeff? Thank you, Edie, and thank you for the catalyst work you're doing to connect uh, these many stakeholders in STEM education. So I am delighted to introduce our Lieutenant Governor. Iowa's dizzying pace of reform in STEM education has us all on our toes. In fact, this year, this month, this week, it's fair to say uh, thousands upon thousands of additional young Iowans are going to be impacted by some exemplary programming that we spent a year setting the table to roll out. And so it's great to have a two-day reprieve out here in in D.C. before we go back and roll up our sleeves again. Our Lieutenant Governor is a, a someone who uh, pours her heart and soul into issues she's passionate about, and she is passionate about STEM education. And so fortunately for Iowans, uh, we're at the cutting edge in some degree of measure in STEM education, thanks to the leadership of our Lieutenant Governor, who shares uh, a co-chair position for the Iowa STEM Governor's Council with you and I as President Ben Allen, but it is my honor to introduce to you Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share Iowa's STEM story. And, you know, I get to be the cheerleader up front, and I get to go around the state and do the rah-rah, but we all know it's the bright, articulate, hard weekend people that we surround ourselves with that really make a difference. And Jeff is one of those people, as well as the managers, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, but we're very fortunate. I am really proud to have the people of, um, very proud of the people of my state for recognizing the need for this ambitious science, technology, engineering, and math initiative, and for rising to the challenge. Just over a year ago, Iowa Governor Branstad signed Executive Order 74, establishing the Governor's STEM Advisory Council, and as Jeff had indicated, I have the honor and privilege of co-chairing that initiative with uh, Ben Allen, who is the President of the University of Northern Iowa. We have 40 dedicated and committed leaders from across Iowa representing business and industry, education, nonprofit, and government who make up our Advisory Council, and they have shown no hesitation or trepidation in their charge. The overarching goal of the Governor's STEM Advisory Council is boosting student interest and achievement in STEM subjects and promoting STEM ec um, economic development. 
The initiative is about innovation, it's about productivity, and it's about opportunity. And so today I will highlight what the Council has done uh, since it was launched just a year ago, and then I'm going to share some of the consensus, the priorities of the Council defining where we are headed in the years to come. Uh, first Iowa stage was set for STEM reform by recognizing that STEM jobs require education beyond high school, either college or career training. But Iowa, like many other uh, states in our nation, as a whole had not been preparing our students well enough for these jobs. Today's employers need better prepared, better trained workforce. And Governor Branstad and I, as we often travel across the state, we hear firsthand from Iowa employers who struggle to fill existing STEM jobs, and we also see it in Iowa's STEM statistics. Too few of our high school graduates are ready for college math and science based on college entrance exams, according to the ACT. Iowa's national, Iowa's national rank in eighth grade math has slipped from number one 20 years ago to middle of the pack. For these and other reasons, we are motivated to implement solutions that help every Iowan achieve STEM. The council is off to a great start with the bipartisan support from our legislature with a $4.7 million appropriation, as well as the backing of Iowa business leaders whose guidance has really been invaluable. The council's first year was devoted to expanding access to great STEM education programs in school and outside school. Iowa, what we discovered is Iowa had some outstanding programs that were providing great results, but it really depended on where you lived, whether you had access to those programs. And we are and we are determined to change that. In May, the council announced the creation of regional STEM networks supported by six coordinating hubs. The six STEM regions promote STEM academic achievement and economic development across the state in also keeping with local interests, needs, as well as resources. Newly hired regional hub managers, who I have a couple with me today, if you would raise your hand, are busy connecting with partners in their regions, including school districts, businesses, and nonprofits that are interested in strengthening STEM education. To deliver stronger STEM education in a convenient one-stop shopping method, the Governor's STEM Council this summer announced the creation of a new pool of high-quality STEM programs. Twelve STEM programs proven to improve student interest and achievement were selected out of 38 applications through a competitive bid process. Right now, those 12 programs are being rolled out throughout the six regional networks, especially to those areas of greatest need. So we are proud that our regional STEM network is working with local partners to deliver more high-quality STEM education programs to people across the state of Iowa. We certainly know that we can't stop there, that there's still much more work to do to make sure that our students are globally competitive when it comes to STEM. We must put the right policies in place to restore Iowa schools to best in the nation and ensure that Iowa students receive a globally competitive education. We need to recognize that all students, not just some students, need a world-class education, and that includes a STEM education. So what's next? Our STEM Council, who is comprised of about 300 individuals from across the state of Iowa, have been meeting in work groups throughout the year to focus on that very question. They have produced thoughtful and strategic recommendations that, when considered together, stand to advance Iowa's STEM initiative over the next several years. The Council's work group rec recommendations fall under six broad categories, and I'm going to run through those briefly. Number one is to establish a STEM professional development center that will provide coordinated, top quality, relevant professional development for STEM teachers. Number two, to improve teacher or STEM teaching training, licensure, and retention. Number three is to build a web portal to house kind of a STEM clearinghouse of a comprehensive searchable database of curriculum, demonstrations, and directory of resources. Number four, establish regional STEM focused schools. And number five, and I think that's been talked about by several other presenters, is to increase public awareness of the importance of STEM 
by launching a campaign to include multimedia messaging focused on STEM careers, and number six, to continue to work with business to commit workforce, facilities, and other resources such as, as equipment to STEM education. The Governor's STEM Advisory Council is just one year old, and for all it has accomplished, we still know we have a great deal of work to do. It's critical that we continue to do a better job of educating all students for STEM careers in Iowa and across the nation so that they, they and states can compete in a demanding global economy. A thriving future for Iowa's business and industry from agribusiness to the financial sector depends on a robust STEM workforce. To ensure that we're meeting our objectives, an inter-university task force of evaluators is monitoring a variety of annual indicators, which include quantity and quality of new STEM teachers, STEM instructional time at school and enrollment in STEM electives, public interest in the urgency of STEM, and STEM scores on Iowa test and national test, STEM workforce readiness and STEM workforce supply and demand. The Iowa testing program is incorporating into this year's test over 360,000 young Iowans, six attitudinal and career interest questions along with customary content and skill items useful in measuring our success. So in closing, our first year has seen the creation of a statewide regional STEM network and a rollout of exceptional STEM education programs for our youth across the state. So thank you for giving me a few minutes on getting the hook to, tell, to talk to you about Iowa's STEM program. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. We're honored to have had your presence and doubly honored since I originally came from Davenport, Iowa. Yay! Go Iowa. Well, many corporations are recent entrants into the world of educational corporate responsi social responsibility, CSR we say. There have, however, been several leaders throughout the years who realized that their future would be de determined by the pipeline of educational talent available to them. Dow is one such, such corporation with a long tradition of investing in our nation's youth. Our next speaker has been charged with integrating Dow's education investments into its entire corporate structure. There are few people who are as qualified to take on this task as our next speaker, Eunice Heath. With over 20 years under her belt at Dow Chemical, Eunice brings an intimate knowledge of her company. Dow and Eunice share our passion for results and I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Eunice Heath. Well, thank you, and it's truly a pleasure for me to be here with you uh, here in the room, and certainly for all of you on the phone as well. Uh, as I had the chance to meet Edie only a few short months ago at uh, CGI in Chicago, actually it was June. It was actually my uh, fifth week on the job uh, in terms of in this new role. I've been running businesses for Dow for over 20 years, and now I have the opportunity to really uh, bring to you um, and to our students really what Dow does in terms of science and technology. So just a, a couple of slides on Dow, just to kind of give you a perspective and to frame for you why investing in our children is a business imperative for our company. Uh, Dow Chemical, we're going to stay in the Midwest, so we were in Iowa, now we're going to go to Michigan is a uh, $60 billion company headquartered two hours north of, of, Mich of uh, Detroit. And uh, we are a company that uh, really the core of everything that we do is around advanced manufacturing and innovation. We combine the power of science and technology to passionately innovate what is essential to human progress, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. We are a global company. We have manufacturing sites, over 197 sites around the world in 36 countries, and we employ 52,000 people. We have one of the largest R&D investments in the global chemical industry of just shy of $1.7 billion. And when you look down at the, the last uh, line there, when you look at all of the uh, pro projects that we have in terms of our innovation pipeline, it is absolutely vital from an advanced manufacturing perspective and an innovation perspective that we invest in our children today and in our workforce for tomorrow. 
So when we look at our portfolio, we have an integrated portfolio of many different markets that you and I touch every day. Uh, from the smartphones you use this morning and continue to use throughout the day, uh, from an electronics perspective to building and construction to infrastructure. We have a portfolio that's focused on making the world safer, healthier, cleaner, more sustainable, and more convenient each and every day. So we need highly talented, skilled um, students and career professionals across every part of our geographies in order for us to achieve growth. So as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the areas that we focus on, uh, on our strategy within Dow, uh, the agricultural segment for, uh, I heard earlier in terms of uh, the, the agricultural segment, when we look at the, the additional billions of people that will be inhabiting our earth years from now, we need to make sure that we're able to feed those people not only today but tomorrow. Energy solutions, alternative feedstocks, energy production and efficiency, energy storage, transportation and infrastructure, bringing clean water uh, to remote parts of the world is what we do. And as I mentioned earlier, um, everything that you do today is powered by Dow technology in terms of electronics that you use each and every day. Next slide. So when we look at the uh, Dow education strategy, um, it is truly aligned to our corporate vision and mission for the company, our mission to passionately innovate what is essential to human progress by providing sustainable solutions, and our education vision is that Dow will advance the interest in, access to, and quality of STEM education to develop an innovative and competitive workforce and create, and I heard earlier in one of the uh, comments I think around the room, is to create a knowledgeable society and value science, that values science and technology. That's absolutely paramount. And our core education beliefs are science and math must be relevant and exciting. Our high performance teachers produce a multiplier effect in terms of STEM pipeline and lifelong continuous learning. The, around the middle part of that section, you see four key critical elements to what we do. Innovation, leadership, and collaboration, science and society, advanced manufacturing, and then ultimately we want to build and seed that talent pipeline as we're also working to redevelop and re, re, uh, re, reinforce the, the workforce development, to ensure that we are partnering with community colleges and universities as we retool the workforce for new advanced manufacturing innovation in the future. And last and certainly but not least, in terms of the STEM talent pipeline, is making sure that we're increasing the understanding of barriers to gender and ethnic diversity to ensure we're reaching our underrepresented minorities as well as girls into science, technology, engineering, and math. So there are four key pillars to our strategy. It's teach, learn, work, and advocate. On the TEACH side, the various partners that we have, uh, not just here in the U.S. but around the world, um, is focused on increasing the teacher confidence and the ability to teach math and science, increased investigative and hands-on instruction. On the learn aspect, our program uh, today has some aspects of early learning, but we're focused on pre-K to 20 as we look at the uh, re refinement that we're making to the Dow STEM education strategy. And that focuses on from pre-K to 20 to careers and building the confidence in math and science in students via hands-on exploration and educating our students, teachers, and counselors about STEM careers. It's so important that they understand uh, what we do day in and day out from a manufacturing, from a science-driven perspective and how that impacts each and every one of us every day. From a work perspective, like I mentioned earlier, building a technical pipeline from the talent pipeline from technical to professional. Uh, community colleges and strategic uni university partnerships are absolutely important for us as we ensure that as we're seeding the earlier stage of the pipeline that we're also able to, ex to get that talent and hire them into some great roles and opportunities within Dow. Last but certainly not least, partnerships like the STEM Connector as we partner to advocate from a federal, state, and a local level to ensure that the needs of industry are well understood as we move forward with our STEM programming. Last and certainly not least is examples, just to give you a few examples here um, on the next slide. 
teacher professional development since 2008, and, and we've been really investing in STEM education for many, many years. As you know, for, as I mentioned earlier, the heart of our company is manufacturing and innovation and chemistry. And so since 2008, since we have been uh, monitoring a number of our programs, we've developed 11,000 teachers, over 11,000 teachers, and focused on in increasing their proficiency. And when we look at the student side, we've touched uh, students over one and a half million over one and a half million students via a number of summer camps, engaging music museums as well, and leveraging our Dow Laboratory Safety Standards as we build into our programs, engaging our employees as well. Um, last and certainly not least, but when we look at some of our strategic partnerships and the recognition that we've achieved. Uh, really reinforcing the power of the collaboration between nonprofit, education, academia, as well as corporations to make sure that we are moving the needle and we're making impact. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. <clears throat> Dow Chemical is amazing. Uh, we depend on energy for so much. Yet in the United States, we often take for granted that when you flip a light switch on, there will be light. Or open a refrigerator, you will find cold food. There are hundreds of thousands of skilled professionals that make these luxuries possible and literally fuel our economy and innovation. Our next speaker has been a tireless advocate for our nation's utility industry in its workforce initiative, the Center for Energy Workforce Development, or as we in the business call it, CEWD. Ann Rendazzo helped found CWD in 2006, serving as its inaugural executive director, a post that she still holds. CWD is focused on building a skilled workforce pipeline for the utility industry, and she is here today to talk about the results project that they have achieved, uh, the, the results profile that they've produced with us. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker and another 100 Women Leader honoree, Ann Rendazzo. Thank you, Ted. For those of you who don't know CEWD, we represent as a national nonprofit the needs of electric and natural gas utilities and other energy partners across the country. We came together back in 2006 with a single question, and that was, what can we do better together than we can do separately? And we figured that out. We can achieve more. We can achieve better results, we can achieve them faster by sharing, and we can achieve them a lot more efficiently. So that's what we focus on, is collaboration by finding things that work and making those available freely to all of our members and to anyone else who, who wants to use them. We achieve those results through regional implementation. We have now 35 states that are represented by Energy Workforce Consortia. Those consortia are groups of utilities and other energy companies that partner with education and with government agencies to identify what the needs are in that state and to make it happen. And they are making it happen from Florida to Washington State. We have examples all across those states of, of incredible things that are happening because people are working together. I'd like to recognize Jennifer Gross, who is here with us, another honoree. Jennifer helped start the first Energy Workforce Consortium in Florida, and they have achieved amazing things at the state level and at the individual level. By working on a pipeline of solutions from career awareness to education, to workforce planning and structure, making sure that we have things in the right place to achieve what we need to. We have metrics. We work together over the last couple of years to identify what does success mean? What does it look like for our industry? And we've identified that. We have six key performance indicators that cover whether or not we have a pipeline that's viable, whether we have qualified workers, and whether or not we are actually hiring because in the end, that's what all this is about, is having those great STEM careers, which means careers in the energy industry. I have a sample of some of the things that we've identified that work. I just want to give you an example of those. First of all, let's talk about our roadmaps. We developed 
Energy Career Roadmaps, we call it putting STEM to work. We need employees who are line workers, who are technicians, who are power plant operators, as well as engineers and scientists and biologists and chemists, all of those. But every single job we have requires STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. It's on the, the most basic of our competencies, level two in our competency model. Everybody needs those skills. So we work to put together roadmaps for careers that help students understand why they're taking these subjects as well as many others and what kind of careers they can move into with those, whether it's something that you can get a certificate right out of high school and move into careers or move into an associate degree or a baccalaureate degree for that. We have um, also developed energy industry fundamentals. It's basically a science course, but it focuses very specifically on our industry and on what the skills are that you need to be able to move in. It's tiers four and five of our industry, things that every single individual needs to know to move into a career in energy. It's available, it's free, it's out right now online as well as in, in paper, and it's available to every school across the country in order to teach the science of energy. We've also developed a math boot camp. The main reason that students and potential workers fail our pre-employment test is they can't do basic math. Now, I'm not talking about calculus. I'm talking about addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, how to read a ruler, how to do percentages. And if they can't do that, they can't pass the test, and they can't get a job. It's true whether you're talking about someone who's come from a technical program at a community college it's true of students who have completed baccalaureate degrees. They have to be able to do that in order to, to get the job. So we have a short-term boot camp that focuses very specifically on those skills to be able to refresh if you've forgotten them and teach them if you never learned them so that you can move ahead and be successful, whether it's in curriculum that's to come or whether it's to actually get the job in our industry. We've also focused on careers in energy week. We now have states all across the country that are working with school systems from um, K through 12 and above to be able to talk to students about our careers and the importance of that schoolwork, whether it's in STEM or other areas, to be able to get these jobs. So understanding that you have to take those courses and they are relevant whether you're going to be a scientist or a mathematician are not is, is critical as we go across the country with the, uh, all the different activities that are available in Careers in Energy Week. If I can leave you with one thought, it's that putting STEM to work idea. There are many, many jobs out there. Our jobs are STEM jobs, and those jobs are STEM jobs whether or not they have, you have a four-year degree or a two-year degree or you're coming out of high school and have a credential associated with it. We need workers in this industry, but they have to have those basic skills in order to get the job. So we are working, again, across the country to make that happen and to make it happen for these great energy jobs. Thank you. Jobs and careers. You know, so often when we look at all the organizations and companies, we're so focused on K-12 through but we don't see that pipeline. So to have CEWD present that pipeline to jobs and all they're doing for careers is extraordinary. Now we turn to the voice of manufacturing. And Jennifer McNally is the president of the Manufacturing Institute and became president in April 2012. Now you see, we have these 100 women in STEM, and you can see from the lieutenant governor to, we just mentioned Southern Air and CEWD here, and now Jennifer McNally from the Manufacturing Institute. Jennifer's a real leader, and she's an advocate, and she's a pusher. So as the Manufacturing Institute was set up to be the voice of manufacturing, 
including is her effort now to push women in manufacturing is we will learn about why the Manufacturing Institute and what they've done about careers and jobs in manufacturing as a real focus for this nation. One of the data points that so impresses us most is the number of certifications from the Manufacturing Institute. So that leader is Jennifer McNally. Jennifer. Thank you, Edie. I am honored and humbled to be here today and certainly to be honored with my um, colleagues as part of the 100 Women in STEM. It really is um, a little overwhelming. Um, and notice Edie said, um, I am a pusher, not a pushover, um, or pushy. Um, and as I think about what I was going to share today in terms of results for the Manufacturing Institute, I think it's important to remember as I look around this room and certainly to the 600 plus individuals that have long gone today is every problem in this nation has been solved somewhere. Yet we as a nation are in the middle of crisis. And we have a crisis of today and we have a crisis of tomorrow. And it impacts our nation's competitiveness and the jobs that we fill today and it impacts the future of our children and the next generation. And our responsibility today, I never leave a room without assignments to everybody, is to stand and lead and to take the islands of excellence and in fact to connect them. So I'm truly honored to be here. As Edie mentioned, the Manufacturing Institute is the national authority on the attraction, qualification and development of world-class talent for our nation's manufacturers. And you know, to, couldn't have said it better in terms of what our nation's manufacturers need. We need strong STEM skills. Manufacturing is, in fact, a STEM-driven element of our nation's economy. And we, in fact, are in crisis. And 600,000 open jobs today go wanting. And this is in a, in a country where we have unprecedented unemployment rates. The fact that we have jobs going wanting isn't a quantity issue. It, in fact, is a quality issue. So from a results-driven organization, I'm going to share what we've done about that because the Institute's um, history and legacy is in documenting the challenges that we have as a nation. So that translates to we're really good at producing reports and putting them on the shelf. And four years ago, we decided there was little harm in action. And I share that because I don't think every problem needs to be solved 100%. I think we need to measure and process improves, and you do that in rooms like we're doing today. So the Manufacturing Institute, I'm going to flip to the next slide. I think I can do that. The Manufacturing Institute set about a course of action in 2011. Um, we actually had noticed that we were starting to hit the headlines from, certainly we're in a political cycle, so from political candidates rhetoric to the front pages of our nation's newspapers, manufacturers could not find qualified workers. So as we stood on stage with the President of the United States, we called for a new course of action for manufacturers. One that would in fact build the pipeline of the future and partner with our education system and one that would find us welders today. Because we in fact do need both of those strategies to be successful as a nation. And what we used was industry-based certifications, a clear articulation between what employers said they needed and a metric, a new metric of measurement to our nation's education systems. Because what we heard from our education partners across the country was don't tell us how to teach, tell us what success looks like in the end. So across the country we partnered with community colleges in the great state of Iowa. I'm so supportive of the significant investment they just received from the U.S. Department of Labor, close to $15 million in manufacturing education. And that was allowed to happen in partnership because of the groundwork manufacturers had done in their communities over the last several years. So today, manufacturers in states across the country are partnering with the education system, with the K-12 system, to actually share with them, here are the credentials we need as a nation. And as Ann pointed out, it really is not just about calculus, though I'm all in favor of those that have calculus. It, in fact, is about strong foundational skills in reading and math and science. And the ability to think on the job and have critical skills, problem solving and teamwork. 
It is a strong foundation that creates the next generation of tomorrow's jobs. Because what we do know certainly about manufacturing is it's fundamentally driven by change and innovation. And if you think about innovation in today's economy, innovation can be process, it can be technology, but first and foremost, it is enabled by people. And if we don't have the individuals in our facilities who have the capacity to innovate, we in fact will not be competitive. We also recognize as manufacturers, it is our time to lead. That if in fact we are to remain the global leader, that we need to have solutions in place. And we need to commit to communities where we live. So we have launched a national manufacturing pledge for manufacturers to stand strong and say, in my community, you can bet I'm going to go back to that pledge and I'm going to crosswalk it to the elements of what good partnership looks like so that I can encourage and drive our nation's manufacturers to make investments in the K-12 system and to support the development of curriculum and science camps and great programs like Project Lead the Way and Skills USA. But most important, we need to be active in our communities to drive change. I also am proud to note that the Manufacturing Institute has launched a strong effort to reinforce the diversity requirements in manufacturing. Not only do we need to focus on the strategies that build the pipeline for the future, we need to create and advance opportunities for individuals in the workforce today and populations that are underrepresented. So one of our pillar initiatives in partnership with University of Phoenix and Deloitte and the Society of Manufacturing Engineers is women in STEM. And if I could have showed up in my pink boots today, I would have. It's about the contribution that women make in science, technology, engineering, and production to our nation's manufacturing economy. It's about the contributions and innovations they make that advance this nation. And as part of our partnership, I'm pleased to announce today our formal partnership with STEM Connect that in fact strengthens the network that we have with STEM Connect and our support for not just the next generation STEM workforce, but this generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I like that. Step it up. That's a great theme. Some innovations arrive in the most elegant of packages. Teach for America is one such innovation. Beginning in 1990, Teach for America has grown from a small group of about 500 teachers to a nationwide initiative with over 28,000 alumni. This year alone, nearly 10,000 Teach for America teachers will reach 750,000 students across the United States. Our next speaker, Melissa Moritz, is a TFA alumna and the director of its STEM initiative, helping support and innovate the efforts of the 3,200 STEM teachers in the Teach for America system. Yet another honoree of the 100 women in STEM, it's my great pleasure to present to you our next speaker, Melissa Moritz. Thank you all so much. Um, as everyone has said, it's an incredible honor to be here today. Uh, throughout our 22-year history, our mission has consistently been to ensure that every child, no matter where they're born, has access to an ed excellent education. Our STEM initiative, however, is a little bit shorter in its history, um, and I wanted to give you a glimpse of, of where we are today. As Bob mentioned, we just crossed an incredible milestone with 10,000 teachers starting on the first day of school this year. And in addition, our incoming 2012 core, 38 percent of those students identify as people of color, 23% were the first in their family to attend college, and 35% are Pell Grant recipients. In terms of our STEM initiative, we launched our targeted STEM initiative in 2006 in partnership with the Amgen Foundation. And just to give a little bit of background, through a very concerted and focused effort on recruitment, we have grown to be one of the largest providers of STEM teachers in the country. The focus of our STEM initiative is threefold. First, to increase the number of STEM core members in our core. Two, to improve our preparation and support program to enhance the effectiveness of our STEM teachers. And three, to maximize the leadership and impact of our alumni in and on STEM education. A few quick numbers to share. 20% of our applicants last year, or 9,500, had backgrounds in STEM. 
as mentioned, 3,200 of our teachers in the 2011-2012 school year were teaching STEM subjects. More than a third of our teachers nationwide are teaching STEM. Since we're here today to talk about results, I wanted to highlight a couple of the most recent studies that have demonstrated that Teach for America Corps members who teach STEM subjects have a measurable, positive, and statistically significant impact on student achievement. First, in Louisiana, we saw that Math and Science Corps member student growth rates were more similar to those of veteran teachers and other novice teachers. Second, an Urban Institute and Calder study showed the effects of having a Teach for America teacher in math and science are about twice the effect of having a teacher with three or more years experience relative to a novice teacher. Third, UNC found Teach for America the most effective source of elementary and middle school math teachers in the state, and Tennessee ranked Teach for America as the top teacher preparation program in the state. And in Charlotte, we found that core members outpaced their non-Teach for America peers when it came to growth in mathematics and science. As you can see, we have a growing body of research from many states across the country demonstrating the impact of our core members on student achievement. So where are we going from here? By 2015, we hope to have 5,000 STEM core members who will impact almost half a million students across the country. We also anticipate having 12,000 STEM alumni of Teach for America, with more than 7,000 of those alumni remaining in education to affect long-term change. In order to get there, we will place a continued emphasis on recruitment of teachers with backgrounds relevant to teach STEM subjects. We will include, um, we will continue piloting innovative training and support, including our partnership with Relay School of Education, where we're building online content modules for secondary mathematics teachers. And we'll also continue to build the STEM community, both amongst our teachers and alumni, and by developing and deepening partnerships with organizations similarly passionate about STEM. And so many of you are in the room this evening, which is really exciting. For more information on our STEM initiative, you can always reach out to me at stem at teachforamerica.org or follow TFA underscore STEM on Twitter. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about our STEM initiative. Ultimately, I want to live in a world where every kid has an excellent STEM teacher standing in front of them. Um, I was super fortunate with my own background. I grew up in a household with an engineer for, as a father and a sixth grade math teacher as a mother. So we did math problems at the dinner table. And that is my dream for everyone, um, to be able to have access to those excellent opportunities. So thank you all for your support, and thank you for being here, and I look forward to doing this with all of you. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, for those of you online, you might recognize Melissa as Melissa Gregson, so she recently changed her name to Morris. Um, she even went to go grab Melissa Gregson name tag today, though, when she got here. So, um, Our next, uh, I'm sorry, I'm finding my spot. Providing hands-on project-based learning opportunities for America's youth has been the sole focus of Project Lead the Way, or PLTW, since it launched its, its Pathway to Engineering program in 12 New York State schools in 1997. PLTW is focused on results and has an active data and evaluation team that constantly seeks to improve its programs and offerings. Our next speaker, Rex Bollinger, serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Engagement Officer for Project Lead the Way. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Rex today. Thank you, Ted, and welcome everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you today about Project Lead the Way and our programs and how we evaluate them. But before I get into that too deeply, I'd like to focus on this slide for just a moment because I think in one image, this has captured what we do at Project Lead the Way and what we're all about. You'll see students engaged in our middle school engineering and high school engineering in this slide. You'll see students engaged in our biomedical sciences. You'll also see an American flag because we're all about growing America and bringing America back to its science and technology global prominence that we once enjoyed. You'll also see a student from Pike Central High School speaking to the president, the rural high school in southern Indiana, about his Project Lead the Ways team's innovation that is an emergency shelter that folds into a very small package with its own water purification system that can be airdropped anywhere in the world where relief is needed. And this is not unlike just last month where the president of the Haitian parliament came to Florida to present an award, the Heart of Haiti Award, to Gulliver Prep students in Project Lead the Way because they had developed a water purification system 
to aid the victims of the earthquake of 2010. I think these kids are incredible, but I would tell you these same kinds of things happen every day in Project Lead the Way classrooms across the United States. In fact, I was encouraged to hear about the STEM initiatives in Washington because this year's National High School Principal of the Year is from Toppingish, Washington, Toppingish High School, which is a full-scale Project Lead the Way school. And Trevor Green, the principal, uh, touts Project Lead the Way as a whole turnaround for their school. And he'll be touring nationally talking about that in this coming year. On the next slide, our mission at Project Lead the Way is to prepare students for the global economy. And we do that through three pillars. One, a world-class curriculum. Secondly, high-quality teacher professional development and an engaged network. Let me talk about each three briefly. We have a superb team of curriculum writers that keep our curriculum current, but they also do that in collaboration with our university partners and our engineers in the field with our corporate partners. Our teacher training consists of a two-week intensive, round-the-clock training that happens on our campuses of our university affiliates, and you cannot teach a Project Lead the Way course unless you take this training. And our engaged network really helps us focus on this critical mission because we're doing this with urgency. Every year we're losing generations of kids who are inadequately trained with the skills to be able to function in a high-tech global economy. And you can see we offer leadership, innovation, continuous improvement, and accountability as our foundation because we owe that to every student in our programs and those who support us. On the next slide, I will talk briefly about our programs. In the center, you can see that we offer seven, nine-week middle school courses that give middle school students a taste of what they'll receive in high school, soon to be eight courses. At the high school level, we offer eight engineering courses, three of which are required as a foundation course to be a Project Lead the Way school. And our biomedical science courses are, are four in depth in focusing on human medicine, disease, genetics, and many other biomedical uh, questions, our largest growing program. On the next slide, I'm pleased to be able to share this with you today because it's the first public unveiling of research from the University of Virginia and Robert Tai and his research team. Many of you may know Robert, but as you review some of these findings and browse them, I'd like to talk about how this worked. Robert Tai is a nationally known researcher for his work in student perseverance and completion and what it takes for a student to complete high school and a college degree, and also at what time do they get turned on about wanting to get into a science-related field? What motivates them? Well, for the last several years, we've had several research studies happening at Project Lead the Way that really were housed in universities. We did not commission these studies. In fact, there were some studies that we didn't even know about. So for the past several months, Robert Ty and his team have collected all of that research nationally. They've evaluated it, synthesized it, and put it into a white paper. Very soon in Indianapolis, where our national headquarters are located, Robert Ty will be conducting a symposium where we'll roll out his entire study. But let me just highlight a couple. The first two bullets to me are very, very important because he speaks directly to the impact that Project Lead the Way has on math and science achievement, as well as engineering achievement and many other important factors. Bullet three talks about the importance of our teacher professional development that I've already mentioned. And bullet four, Robert says precisely Project Lead the Way is the type of program that we need in this country to reverse the outflow of STEM education. I want to talk also about where this research has taken place. Universities such as the University of Minnesota, University of Iowa, University of Wisconsin have conducted some of these research studies. I would tell you that many universities actively recruit Project Lead the Way students. This fall, the University of Minnesota announced that one-third of their incoming class of, of engineers for the College of Engineering were Project Lead the Way students. Wow. San Jose State University 
provides 60% of the engineers for Silicon Valley. The president of Santa State University six months ago said, we will offer preferential admission to Project Lead the Way students. Two months ago, he changed that. What he said was, any student that meets minimum requirements for the University of Santa Jose State University and completed a, project, a, a program of study successfully at Project Lead the Way may have guaranteed admission to San Jose, San Jose State University. These are very important ways that we evaluate our program and its effectiveness. On the final slide, perhaps our greatest partner is the Toyota Corporation, arguably maybe the most studied corporation in the world. They've studied Project Lead the Way for seven years and we didn't even know about it. Last year they announced that Project Lead the Way would be the foundation of all their new employee training starting with high school, they're recruiting high school students, and in the state of Kentucky where they piloted this, they recruit Project Lead the Way students into their facility to train them in cooperation with the Bluegrass Community and Technical College and the University of Kentucky where students can receive advanced manufacturing degrees and engineering degrees within their facility in cooperation with those two universities. We're very pleased to have Toyota as a partner. I'd like to talk to you more about the program if you're interested. I really believe this has significant impact for American manufacturing. Thank you. Another woman heroine. Lucy Sanders has come from a background on AT&T, Bell Labs, Avaya, but she had a passion to put to bear, and that truly was to lead the way for women and computing science. So for the National Center for Women and Information Technology, as we call NCWIC, it's been built by a strong woman, Lucy Sanders, who co-founded it to absolutely change what women and girls would study and would build into careers. So, Lucy, you've taken that charge, and I guess another quote that we have, as you said, is senior leaders need to speak out loudly and often about the importance of STEM to our country and you of ensuring that women and girls are there are doing it. Lucy Sanders. Hello, I'm really honored to be here to speak with you. And I'm going to speak about a specific STEM discipline, um, if I may, and that is information technology. We use the broad definition of information technology to mean all things computing, right? NCWIT is a public-private partnership that was originally funded by the National Science Foundation in 2004, and, and we carry on our work today through um, the generous grant from the National Science Foundation as well as our corporate sponsors. I want to take a minute and frame for you what computing really does mean. Right? So when we talk about we have a specific STEM discipline, what is that? First of all, it's not educational technology. Although important, educational technology, which is the use of computing to deliver learning, is not what we mean by the study of computing. It's also not computing literacy. All right? That's the use of computing. What we are talking about here is women's participation in the creation of new products and services. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's bring that. So we were asked to bring some success models for you today, and I'm, I'm showing you NCWIT's success model. NCWIT is a change leader network. So we are not a women's network, although I think women's networks are very, very important. We're a change leader network. We are an organization of organizations. Over 325 organizations are members of NCWIT, and we work across the full computing pipeline. In fact, some of our members are here today. I think there's one speaking right after me. Uh, so we work in the K-12 space with organizations like Teach for America and Girl Scouts and Girls, Inc., our K-12 alliance reaches over half the young women in the United States today, and an increasing number of their adult stakeholders. 
We have over 200 universities that are part of our academic alliance, all working to teach better, to recruit better, and to retain young women in their degree programs. We have a corporate alliance working to recruit, retain, advance technical women into their companies. We also have a startup alliance. So when you see this little circle that says learning communities, our alliances are all in action all year long. They are working within their own organizations. They are working together on projects across the United States to make a difference for girls and women in computing. The next circle is around evidence, and we had an earlier speaker um, from 4-H talk about you know, the benefits of research. Uh, when we first got started, we did not have any quality resources in this country specifically focused on girls and women in computing. We had resources around girls in math or women in business or something else, but not specifically on girls and women in computing. And so we set about to do that, to put data sheets, research papers, toolkits, talking points in our change leaders' hands so that when they took the risk and stepped out, they would be basing it on evidence. So that's our model. I'm happy to say that it's beginning to yield results, and I'm going to quickly show you three. Aspirations in Computing is a talent development program that starts in high school. Um, and I wanted to say this was built from the observation that young women in high school who were in fact demonstrating excellence in computing were not being acknowledged. They were either in isolation in their own classrooms, there's only one in their class, the only one in their school, if they were lucky enough to have computer science taught in school, or they were self-taught. And so we set about to acknowledge them with an award program saying you're important to us, keep going. This award program went viral with our members. So now we have over 55 regions across the United States acknowledging young women in high school. And we have a national award program sponsored by the Bank of America. And um, that's just the beginning. So the award isn't enough. We enter them into an online community. They stay connected. Our, our universities offer them scholarships. Our corporations offer them internships and jobs. This shows the power of when we come together, over 325 people from across the pipeline, we can build a national talent pool. We're on track to add 1,000 new girls in 2013 into this program. Very diverse, very diverse. We already are seeing what they're doing when they graduate from college. You can see the percentage in terms of graduate or majoring or minoring in male-dominant STEM professions. The next one is our academic alliance. I want to say a woohoo for the universities of this country. <laughs> you know, we often overlook them. I think they're critical in the solutions in this space. They reach out into the K-12 local communities, and of course they reach forward into corporations. Our academic alliance already seen um, increased percentages of women enrolled in their degree programs. You can see the number, 60%. And they do this by, by self-governing seed fund programs. So we have one sponsored by Microsoft Research and one sponsored by Symantec where they actually hand the funds out to their colleagues based on a peer review process to help them with their outreach efforts and their cultural efforts on campus. Over $400,000 has been distributed through these seed funds to our members. So yay universities. I just think they're very, very important. The last thing I wanted to bring in here was a corporate program. It's called Paysetters. Um, the truth of the matter is the academics actually participate in this as well. Paysetters is really built upon the simple fact that says we can't change that which we don't measure. Right? So, so we have set up this new metric called Net New Women, and it's basically how many, how many women can you add in your corporation to the national talent pool. So no fair playing the shell game by going and offering women from other companies a higher salary. We really want to build the U.S. talent pool. And, and we form cohorts and they set goals and, um, and then we work for two years together to try to reach that goal as a cohort. So we exceeded our goal by 600 net new women. We had a, we had a goal for 1,000 and we actually put in 1,600. So with that, I want to leave you um, with a request because of course I can't go anywhere as a nonprofit CEO without leaving you with a request. Everybody in this room has an aspirations in computing region in your backyard or close to it, maybe a few hours away. So if you're interested in helping us build that talent development pipeline for computing, write me at info at ncwit.org and we'll connect you. Thank you. What a dynamo. Thank you so much, Lucy. Another dynamo is coming up. An extraordinary leader for women in STEM, 
Our next pres presenter will be Betty Shanahan, the CEO and Executive Director of the Society of Women Engineers, or SWE as we call them. The Society of Women Engineers disperses 188 new and renewed scholarships totaling $540,000 every year to women pursuing STEM degrees and careers. It's also known as being a primary network for young women and other women in careers in STEM engineering. So without further ado, Betty Shanahan. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'd actually like to frame my discussion by giving you a little bit of the history of our organization. The Society of Women Engineers was founded in 1950 when that group of women engineers and engineering students and some men came together to form the organization. Now, during the 50s and 60s, uh, those women would have seen something that was very much like uh, engineering when they founded the organization. But during the 70s and the first half of the 80s, the percentages of women in engineering started to increase. But about 1985, something happened where the absolute numbers of women in entering engineering stayed pretty fixed. Percentages moved a little bit as the number of men decreased and then starting in 2005 increased. Well, the number of women really ha uh, entering engineering programs has not really changed since about 1985. Uh, Today, about 18% of engineering and technology degrees go to women. Uh, our organization captures our mission with the tagline of Aspire, Advance, Achieve. Aspire is about reaching out to girls and, very importantly, their adult influencers to encourage them to see engineering and technologies as careers. Uh, Advance is retaining women from the moment they enter the first college class through their retirement, retention and advancement of women, and then ACHIEVE is finally recognizing women for their accomplishments as engineers and leaders. Our organization has a number of programs that have, are written up in the uh, background sheet, and I just wanted to focus on a couple of results because we have only 22,000 members and one and a half million girls graduate from high school each year. So you don't need much of a math background to understand there's a scale issue there. Uh, to encourage girls and people from other underrepresented groups to pursue careers in engineering and technology, we require everyone, not just women, to be not just women engineers, to be encouraging them. So I want to focus on a few programs that I think have brought real results and can be used by others. I also want to highlight that we have. Uh, on our Aspire website, a number of exciting uh, programs, uh, outreach activities, most of which we've actually uh, uh, lifted and partnered with other organizations that have quality material. Uh, so what I want to focus on are a couple specific initiatives. One is maximizing the message. And maximizing the message uh, is basically says that messaging positively impacts or, or can negatively impact the perception of engineering. This program is based on a few key programs, most notably the National Academy of Engineering's Changing the Conversation, which uh, is research-based messaging on what messages resonate with young people, particularly young people from underrepresented groups in engineering. And I should acknowledge uh, that the chairs of that are the National Academy of Engineering's uh, President Chuck Vest and DuPont's Ellen Col uh, Chair, uh, CEO Alan Coleman. We also have material in maximizing the messaging from TechBridge on how to be a role model for girls and other advanced training so that anyone who is actually going to reach out to girls will be effective, whether that's a, a, a girl or, or a, a man. Uh, the other uh, program I want to really highlight is Outreach for Change. Outreach for Change was originally designed for engineering professional societies to help them build their capacity in uh, having effective outreach programs for uh, girls of all races and ethnicities. And although we designed it for engineering professional organizations, there is nothing in here that does not make it effective for anybody who's volunteering, be it in a, a corporate uh, world or in formal education. Uh, what, uh, this program was actually a, a National Science Foundation sponsored program 
and it was a coalition of ourselves, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers who are here, the National Society of Black Engineers, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Uh, and the, the idea behind Outreach for Change is to uh, increase the capability of the outreach volunteer to effectively interact with uh, young, uh, young people from underrepresented groups. Uh, one of the comments that uh, Jennifer McNeely mentioned earlier is innovation is enabled by people. Well, I'm going to tell you that innovation is enhanced by diverse teams. And as much as we can talk about the numbers of engineers and scientists we need, as much as we uh, can talk about the uh, moral imperative of including all Americans, our nation's competitive advantage is our diversity, and we do not leverage it in STEM. So it is very important that all the uh, outreach that we do to young people very much includes all Americans, all American children, so that our nation can uh, uh, take advantage of our best, our competitive advantage. Uh, so, without Outreach for Change, I would encourage anyone to look at the materials there. There are really four main components to Outreach for Change. The first is, again, the same messaging that I talked about in maximizing the message. The second is bias literacy, helping all of us understand when we go into a, uh, an outreach uh, uh, situation that we will uh, understand the biases that we carry into that situation and do not let those biases prevent us from being effective. Uh, thirdly, cultural awareness to understand where the young people we're, we're, coming, we're trying to interact with are coming from. And then finally, uh, assessments. We have a, a assessing women and men in the engineering program. How do we bring a formal assessment to everything we do so that we are the most effective? And finally, let me wrap up with one last uh, uh, initiative that we've got, our, our, our advanced, uh, SWE advanced program. And this actually moves into when women are studying engineering or in the engineering profession. SWE has developed and worked with experts to put together an online set of curriculum with more than 200 uh, webinars. Many of these actually uh, qualify for CEUs and PDHs for someone who's, who requires their, uh, to maintain their certification. And these are uh, webinars and training to support professional development areas of communications, leadership, um, global engagement, and really helping women advance through all stages of their career. So all of these are available on websites, and uh, if I can ask you to do anything, if this gets a nonprofit uh, CEO, I also have to leave you with a request, is that if you're going to do one thing, is if you're going to send someone out to interact with young people, work on enhancing their competency and being effective in, in those outreach activities. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Patty Curtis is the director of the Washington office of the Museum of Science, uh, Boston, and the National Center for Technological Literacy. Patty oversees programs that reach 40,600 teachers and almost a million students nationwide. And talk about metrics. In 2011, 211,000 school children took field trips to the Museum of Science in Boston. 97,000 individuals were served by the museum's traveling programs, which covered 65,566 miles. 714 volunteers contributed more than 54,357,000 ,000 hours last year, the equivalent of 26 full-time staff. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Patty Curtis. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your persistent patience. Uh, thank you to Edie and Bob and Ted and Tim and, and obviously the Cisco Foundation for recognizing and highlighting the Museum of Science in the STEM Results Project. And you got a little intro there, but a uh, little background. The Museum of Science in Boston is one of the top three science centers. Okay, what happened? Just number one. No, oh, sorry. It's one of the top three science centers in the nation. We have over a $50 million operating budget, a $95 million endowment, over 200 corporate members, 310 employees full-time, uh, and 150, I'm sorry, 1.5 million visitors each year. Our National Center for Technological Literacy was established in 2004 by the museum president, 
and former Dean of Engineering, Yanis Mialis. Uh, the mission of the NCTL is to integrate engineering education in museums, science centers, and K-12 classrooms nationwide. We are the vowel in STEM, as someone referred to it yesterday. The Museum of Science is known for many, many things, but our selection to the STEM results project is because of our ability to scale projects, particularly our engineering education initiative. So how do we do that? Uh, this is our theory of action, but what we do primarily is to work on state standards, national standards, to integrate engineering design skills. We align state, uh, we also work to align state and national assessments, that's not measured, it's not treasured, probably not top. And then we also uh, to enable teachers to deliver on those standards and meet assessments, we uh, develop uh, integrative STEM and engineering curricula. And to really make that happen, we've developed a network of professional development providers across the country to work with teachers in uh, enhancing their STEM delivery. Um, all of our educational products are research-based, teacher-tested, and aligned with appropriate educational standards. One of our most popular products is the series called Engineering is Elementary. Originally funded by a $2.5 million NSF development grant, EIE has subsequently attracted over $16 million in public and private funding. With respect to the development, each EIE unit took about 3,000 hours to develop just 8 to 10 hours of instruction. We work with teachers across the country to make this fit their needs. This iterative process demonstrates our commitment and our responsiveness to teacher feedback and classroom demands. Our existing research shows that all learners, including girls, English language learners, underrepresented minorities in engineering, that used EIE gained in their understanding first in technology and engineering, but also improved their science performance. In addition, the children that were exposed to engineering as elementary are more likely than control group children, I pity them, uh, to express an interest in engineering as a career. I'm happy to report as well that we just received a coveted uh, NSF DRK-12, which is a discovery research grant to further evaluate engineering as elementary across different regions of the nation. Um, this grants another $2.8 million to further our research. At the heart of our mission is to increase the understanding of the engineering design process. This one here, we use with the elementary students. We explain to teachers, parents, students, that the scientific inquiry uh, is really exploration of the natural world and all of its wonderful phenomena. The engineering design process is really the development of new technologies or the human-made world to respond to human wants and needs. Thanks to the National Research Council's framework for K-12 science education and, most hopefully, the next generation science standards, Engineering is now considered a cross-cutting idea, a key practice, and a core concept in addition to life, physical, and earth sciences. We and our engineering as elementary professional development partners have trained nearly 40,000 teachers and reached nearely 3 million students since its inception. Thanks in large measure to our friends at DuPont, this past summer we conducted a statewide professional development institute to roll out engineering as elementary across the state of Delaware. And I've heard many good things at the Triangle uh, Coalition meeting yesterday. Other states are considering similar uh, statewide rollouts. We also create middle, high school, and out of school engineering curricula. Here you can see building math, which blends algebra and engineering design challenges, engineering the future, which is a full, high, full year high school course, uh, engineering Now, our new middle school science and engineering series, and Engineering Adventures. The first two uh, on the left are currently on the market and uh, being implemented in a number of states, and the other two are currently under development. And with respect to Engineering Adventures, uh, we are seeking uh, pilot teachers, and this is a downloadable free uh, product. Our Gateway Project is our strategic K-12 district-wide leadership engagement program. We work with schools and district uh, leaders to develop technology and engineering action plans. 
These include three-day institutes, progress sessions, annual symposia, a sharing of effective practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to date, we've worked with over 100 school districts in Massachusetts, Maine, and Texas. The Nanoscale Informal Science Education Network, kind of a mouthful, but NISNET, is another uh, extensive 10-year uh, uh, NSF grant uh, totaling $40 million to the Museum of Science, the Exploratorium, and the Science Museum of Minnesota. This is really to develop and introduce or develop products and information uh, tools for delivering uh, nanoscale, nanoscience, and engineering to the public at large. What is nano? Well, it's actually the exploration of materials at the nanoscale level. There are one billion nanoscales. There are one billion nanos in a meter, so it's pretty small. The materials of these, uh, the properties of the materials at this scale react very differently than what we would expect. So it's leading to exciting breakthroughs in, in uh, computing, engineering, medicine, and other uh, development of new materials. So the NYSNET has created over 200 products for uh, informal science institutions across the country, uh, many exhibits, many grants. Uh, so as you can tell, we are working across the country um, to bring nanoscience and engineering to the public at large. So hopefully that demonstrates that the Museum of Science is not just a local attraction. We are working and serving as a resource to the nation at large. Because we partner with other science centers, community colleges, universities, researchers, teacher organizations, school districts, and other out-of-school programs, we have a tremendous reach. Our funders include federal, state, and local agencies, private, corporate, and philanthropic foundations, and for these uh, contributions we are forever grateful. We couldn't do it without them. It'd probably take me seven minutes to list all of them. Um, and we're always looking for more interested parties that are willing to pursue and advance uh, engineering education. So I hope you'll consider joining us. Thank you, Patty, and it's, it's wonderful. I've seen Patty build the presence of the Science Museum in D.C. It's, it's a major player these days, and it's so exciting, the programs that they are conducting and the enthusiasm that they bring. And I remember as a kid how much I loved going to the Science Museum in Chicago and what an impact that had on my own life. So great job, Patty. We're so excited now. We're actually going to a different sort of category today. And one of the interesting discoveries of our results project is the following. Trade and professional organizations, disciplinary societies, often don't even think of themselves as STEM organizations. And yet they're conducting salary surveys, career things, curriculum development. If you look at the categories that we have on the STEM Connector site, the taxonomy we created, we are developing results profiles for virtually all of those types of organizations and, and species of organization, you know, uh, types by subject area. So I'd urge you to look at that and ask yourself, do you think of yourself as a STEM organization? which allows me to segue into the uh, latter part of our program. The American Chemical Society, ACS, it's a juggernaut. It's a model organization for tracking STEM results that relate to, relate to both its roles in STEM education, STEM careers, STEM research in the chemical enterprise, STEM teaching, curriculum development, green chemistry, STEM advocacy. ACS is everywhere, and it's been a tremendous supporter of our efforts in this area. For example, they've supported the STEM education report cards that we've been running for 12 years. You will find them on our STEM Connector site. I think you'll really enjoy it. And it's my special pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mary Kirchhoff. Mary and I actually worked together for years. She was in the office next to me, heading up the Green Chemistry Institute at the ACS. Mary is now Director of Education Division for the American Chemical Society. ACS is astonishing. It's, it serves more than 164,000 members. I think technically it's the world's largest scientific society. It's global. It's everywhere. And uh, Mary provided me more than a 200-page document of metrics, indicators, MBOs. Call them what you want. They're all over the board. I want Mary to describe some of the work that they've done. Thank you.
Thank you, Bob. Mercifully, I'm not going to describe 200 pages worth of results to you, so uh, that should be a relief. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And as Bob mentioned, ACS is the world's largest single scientific society with more than 164,000 members. And education features very prominently in our charter. And we provide educational programs, products, and services for learners and educators going from kindergarten up to practicing chemists. Um, the education division's mission is really to serve learners and educators by pro building communities and providing effective, high-quality uh, products, services, and information. And so what I'd like to do in the few minutes this afternoon is just highlight the impact of a handful of the programs within the education division. First one of these is Project C. And C stands for Summer Experiences for the Economically Disadvantaged. This program was started in 1968, and it takes high school students and provides them with a summer research experience uh, in, in their local area. We work with our 187 uh, ACS local sections around the country and in Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico to coordinate these activities. So we rely very heavily on our volunteers. The mentors um, not only provide the research experience, but they also provide guidance and career advice to the students. And it's been a very effective program, as you can see from the metrics here. Since 1968, we've had more than 9,000 high school students go through Project C. Some students do one summer. Students are also eligible to do a second summer of research. Of these, 90% go on to college. This program is not designed to churn out future chemists, even though that would be delightful. What it's really designed to do is give these students the confidence that they can go on to higher education. After the first 25 years of the program, we did an assessment looking at the students who've been through the program, and what was remarkable to me was that half of them said they decided to go on to college as a result of their Project Seed experience. So it really is very effective, and you can also see that this experience is transformational as 70% of the students go on to earn degrees in STEM. The second program I wanted to highlight is our ACS Scholars Program. And this program provides scholarships for undergraduates who are majoring in chemistry, chemical engineering, and the chemically related sciences. This program is really in, uh, emphasizes increasing the diversity of the chemistry pipeline because the scholarships are open to students from underrepresented groups, uh, African American, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American. But in addition to providing financial support, ACS also provides support in terms of career guidance and just somebody to talk to because uh, getting through chemistry or chemical engineering can be very challenging for, for five or six years. And having somebody you can talk to as you face challenges is a critically important part of a project uh, of ACS scholars. Approximately 80% of the scholars do go on to earn degrees in the chemically related sciences and more than 120 have earned PhDs. Um, it's also very important that we have tremendous corporate sponsorship uh, to assist with providing the scholarships to these students. And in particular, we've got both Dow and DuPont here who have been long-term supporters of the ACS Scholars Program. We we're very grateful. I know on your last slide, Eunice, you also had the Chemistry Olympiad, which was absolutely amazing this summer. 72 countries, 283 students. Uh, participating in the International Chemistry Olympiad. Not all the action was in London this summer. It was right here in Washington, D.C. A very different type of program is the ACS approval process. This was established in 1936, and this is our oldest uh, program in education. It was established because industry said, we want some measure of quality of the students that are coming out of these four-year programs in chemistry. And so ACS put together the ACS approval process, and this is totally, again, run by volunteers in terms of reviewing all of the applications that come in every year and uh, determining whether or not they are going to remain as an approved school and identifying areas where they can approve. One of the things we, use to, we, we do continuously is revising the guidelines in response to community needs. So we were getting the message from chemistry faculty and students that it was too restrictive. So in 2008, more flexibility was built into the guidelines so students could major in specific areas, such as material science and not just straight chemistry. So that's been a real advantage. One of the other areas I mentioned at the beginning is community building. Our second oldest program is that of student chapters. In 1937, ACS established a program for undergraduates. We started with seven chapters on seven different campuses and 193 students, and today we have more than 8,000 chapters and more than 17,000 undergraduates 
A lot of what the students do is engage in community outreach, going into elementary and high schools and helping to instill uh, a love of chemistry, at least their or curiosity about chemistry. The other uh, community we have that's very strong is a recent one, only seven years old, Chem Clubs. These are for high school students. We've grown in seven years from 15 clubs to almost 500. Again, it's a way for students to explore their interest in chemistry in a way that there's, you don't have the pressure of a grade. You can do this as an after-school activity. And outreach, is, again, is a huge component with many of these students going out to elementary schools to interact with those students and, again, try to get them interested in sciences. And lastly, I want to talk about a, a new program we launched just three years ago called ACS Science Coaches. And this partners a K-12, excuse me, a K-12 teacher with uh, a chemist. And it's not for us to come in and say, here's what you're going to do. It's for the coach and teacher to identify, where does the teacher need assistance? And sometimes it's helping with laboratories. Sometimes it's helping the teacher develop his or her content knowledge. Sometimes it's helping clean up the chemicals that they've inherited in the lab and they don't really know what to do with. But it's really identifying what makes most sense to the teacher. And it's a year-long program. It's not just a one-time visit. It spans the entire school year. And because it's a new program, we thought assessment was important early on. So we worked with the Yazursky Research Group at the University of Miami. And you can see we've gotten very good results at this pilot, which is going to be continuing for another three years. So that's just a very quick snapshot of some of the programs. Um, I'd be happy to discuss offline some of our other, other programs with you. And I hope to continue these STEM connections that we've established here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. It's wonderful what uh, is going on. And one thing that I wanted to mention about the trade and professional organizations, all of them that we know of, the major ones are up on the site, but we know that we're missing thousands of them. And I think this is one of the important findings of the results project. We've got to start inventorying, mapping, mapping and analyzing what's going on within these entities. Many of them, as I said, don't understand their critical role in that transition from K through 12 to community college to higher education to the workforce and the continuing role in the workforce. One of the organizations that I'd like to discuss, but very briefly because for the sake of time, is SPIE. Oh, excuse me, I got out of the sequence, but we'll do that. SPIE is uh, the Photonics and Optoelectronics Organization, the International Society for Photonics, Optics and Photonics. But SPIE is another organization that typically uh, is conducting career pathing, has major student chapters across the world. If you go to their uh, meetings and their conventions, you will see how this knowledge is diffused. This STEM knowledge is diffused in a very, very important industry. They just released the Harnessing Light 2 report I would urge all of you to check that out, and in the future, we hope to be very, very uh, aggressive, and, and we would refer you to the profiles that you see in your packet. You can learn all those details, but we're very excited that as we discover more about trade and professional organizations, this will be a major contribution in the results project. Thank you. Let's see if we can get us back online here. There we go. Good. Okay. Uh, our final speaker today uh, is uh, Dave Saba from is it Saba or Saba? Saba. Saba from the National Math and Science Initiative, uh, as we call it in the business, NIMSI. Uh, there are a few organizations that have gone, grown as fast and gone as far as promoting STEM education on a national scale than the National Math and Science Initiative. Our next speaker, Dave Saba, is NIMSI's executive vice president and runs the Laying the Foundation Initiative that provides comprehensive teacher training programs. NIMSI is committed to metrics and to demonstrating its efficacy through the data that it collects about its programs. It is our pleasure to introduce you to our next and final speaker, Dave Sava. Thanks. Wow, the final speaker. So if you remember nothing else from today, I hope you, I can leave you with this one stat that's so impactful that it will stick in your mind for, for a very, very long time. And that's that we're in 1.5% of the high schools in this country, but we account for 7.4% of the increase in college readiness as it relates to STEM. And that's a pretty incredible record. And let me explain how we do that. We're tired of piloting. We think America is addicted to the pilots, and it's time to move from pilots and incremental change to really significant improvement in student outcomes. So we do two things. We transform schools 
and we transform teaching. And the way we transform schools is we, focusing, we focus on opening college readiness for all through a comprehensive program that works with administrators. It sets very aggressive goals. It gives teachers the training and the resources they need to really focus on STEM. And then we measure those outcomes specifically as it relates to AP success on science, math, and English. Because if you can't do English, you're not going to be a good STEM professional. The way we transform teaching is we work at it from two different angles. We train teachers to deliver more rigorous content. We do that by focusing on pedagogy and giving them the content and the skills they need, plus giving them really rigorous project-based lessons they can use in schools that relate to what they're doing within their current curriculum. We also have the UTeach program, where we focus on recruiting math and science majors they earn their Bachelor of Arts or their Bachelor of Science in their content, and they end up with a teaching certificate. As far as transforming, um, no, those are our common programs. We also work with Common Core. We have been working with the PARC Consortium to build capacity within the 23 PARC states on Common Core because we feel that's such a critical element in really focusing on the STEM issue. So here's where we are. We're in 462 schools. We reached 11,000 teachers who are reaching over 2.1 million students while we are transforming schools. That's our focus right now. As far as just working with teachers themselves, we'll have, we have completed training for over 50,000 different teachers, and our UTeach program is now in 34 different universities, and we currently have 5,000 undergrads, STEM-focused undergrads, who are going to complete the program and go into teaching. Here's the results. When I talk about we're not about incremental, that's not incremental results right there. You can see right there that, whoops, sorry, 294 schools finished their first year. This is their first year of our program of transforming their schools. We had a 79% increase in math, science, and English AP success versus 7% increase in the country. As far as just math and science, it's 84 versus 7 percent. If you're looking for closing the gap on college readiness for African American and Hispanic students, 107 percent increase in our 290 board schools versus 14 percent for the rest of the country. And for female, 84 percent increase in AP success versus 7 percent. And this is on math, science, and English AP exams. Over three years, we have 136 schools that have been in the program for three years. Here's the results you can expect. The nation had an average increase of AP success of 24%. We had a, an increase of 137%. For our African American and Hispanic students, as far as closing the gap, 203% increase in our schools. That's an incredible result. And as far as females, 167% versus 26% as far as nationwide goes. What does that look like over time for a school? This is, our, this is the average of all our schools versus the average of what's going on in the rest of the country. And our schools start out with an average of 78 passing scores per 1,000 students versus the national average of 115. By year three, we cross the line right away in year one. By year three, we have 198 passing scores versus 135 for the rest of the country. We really, truly do transform schools. We create a, a college-going culture. And if you're wondering if AP success is maybe a good indicator for college readiness or college success, our Arkansas Department of Ed tracks students now all the way through college. So here's what happens if you haven't taken any AP. You're a 64% chance that you're going to have to take remediation. You're going to pass about 17 hours of college credits in your first year with a GPA of 2.2. If you take an AP without even passing, you already cut remediation in half down to 33%. You end up with 26 hours and a GPA of 2.7. And if you pass just one math, science, or English AP, you, went, you end up with only 11% remediation, 32 hours of credit, and a GPA of 3.2. AP 
is an outstanding indicator of whether or not you're gonna succeed. We dramatically improve the number of kids that are going into AP, and we come up with results like that. American students can't wait for more programs. We're right now operating, we just got an I-3 grant to operate in Indiana and Colorado, that's a three-year grant. We have a Department of Defense grant to expand our program into 50 more schools over the next two years. The Department of Defense figured out that their recruits are coming from the high schools outside the base, and those high schools better be producing STEM experts, so they want us in those schools so we can help them. So now we've got 50 schools that are, and are under our initiative for military families. So we're expanding rapidly, but as every CEO up here has done, we need your help. We need to grow this into more schools, we need to grow this into more states, and we need to do it now. Students cannot wait. It's time for us to take action, it's time to move away from incremental and get results like we do at National Math and Science. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thank you everybody online for joining us today. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to look at who's been on here but uh, I think we were well over 200, probably over 300. Um, we had over 400 registers, so we could have been there. I got emails from people that couldn't get on, uh, and I'm assuming that's because we were at our maximum capacity. So uh, thank you very much, everyone online. We're going to end the webinar now, and uh, it's going to be taken within the room. <laughs>